Hello and welcome. This is Separated by Force, Afstands Motors in the Netherlands. My name is Sarah Tekert and I'm currently recording this in the studio of our cooperation partner Broadcast Amsterdam. Today as a guest on this episode, I have Lisa Marie Combe with me, a human rights lawyer from the Netherlands. She is working at Prake d'Oliveira in Amsterdam and she is representing one of the Afstands Motors. She has been approached by Trudy Schrelegerze in the summer of 2019 as Trudy has decided she wants to sue the Dutch state for the injustice that has been done to her in the past. Lisa Marie, welcome. Thank you. How did you first come across the topic of Dutch Afstands Motors? The first uh, real confrontation was, in fact, the classical lawyer-client situation in which Trudy approached me and told me what had happened to her, and I was quite awestruck. And uh, yeah, that's when I started looking deeper into what happened to her and to other women. Had you heard of this issue before? Was this in any way a familiar topic to you? Well, I had heard about the separation of mothers and their children in uh, different contexts in other countries. But there had been very little uh, public debate or media uh, information about the issue within the Netherlands. So I hadn't been familiar with the, the issue in the Netherlands itself. Could you briefly sum up Trudy's case? What happened to her? In a nutshell, uh, what happened to Trudy is that um, she was unmarried, and she became pregnant and she gave birth to a son in 1968. She, as that was the situation of unmarried women back then and also in the years preceding uh, 1968, um, as an unmarried woman, she was looked down upon, it was frowned upon to have children outside of marriage. In fact, Trudy was uh, led into a dead end road where the only outcome was that yeah, she would be separated from her son after uh, seeing that her son suffered in a children's home she eventually after about after more than two years she gave in and agreed to having him adopted in one of our preparation meetings for this episode you told me that i may not use the term forced adoption can you explain why that is yes there is in fact there's two reasons why the term forced adoption is incorrect we must see the step of Children, separating children from their mothers as one step and adoption as a second step. And why isn't it correct to speak about forced adoption is because, firstly, the adoptive parents were never forced to adopt a child. It was their free wish to adopt a child. And secondly, not all children were actually adopted in the end. So there's also children who might have been placed with foster parents but were never adopted. And there might even be children who were never placed into a family. So that's why the term forced adoption isn't correct. What was the legal situation back then? Was it lawfully right to separate mothers and their babies? No, it wasn't. Not at all. The law was actually progressive in the sense that it explicitly recognized in law that there was family bond between an unmarried woman and her child. Between the bond of an unmarried mother and her child and a married mother and her child, there was, while well, it had a different name in law, but the, the level of protection granted to this bond by law was exactly the same. The law back then was comparable to the law today. It prescribes that the family bond between a mother and her child must be protected. In 1956, the adoption law was, adop uh, was adopted in Dutch Parliament. And it's interesting to look at also the history of that law. So what was introduced by the adoption law was firstly the, the possibility to do, adopt a child, meaning that you severe the family bond between uh, the natural mother and her child or the natural parents and her child and uh, create new family bonds which are then protected in law like any other family bond between the child and its adoptive parents. However, uh, creating this bond of uh, family ties with the adoptive parents was only a second step. The law prescribed a first step, namely to protect the natural bond between the natural parents and the child. 
And it was only in in very restrictive circumstances and if the the needs and rights of the child absolutely required this, that the state was entitled to severe the bond between natural parents and their children. And what is interesting, if we look at the history of the adoption law, is that back then it was explicitly discussed that the group of people who would be most likely to get into the situation where the question of adoption is even on the table would be unmarried mothers. And in the parliamentary debate, although back then and and in, I think, the decades and and, uh, preceding this debate, unmarried mothers were looked down upon, but nevertheless... The, in the parliamentary debate, the, uh, the Dutch uh, parliament agreed that the bond between a natural mother and her child must be protected. And they also recognized that unmarried women were in a very vulnerable position exactly because they were so frowned upon in their situation. And thus that these women were, were needed protection. So one of the ideas behind the adoption law of 1956 was actually to take uh, or to to formalize adoption to prevent that unmarried mothers would be pressured in informal settings and that children would be secretly given to, to other families who would then raise them as their own. The whole idea was that by formalizing the process, the first step would also be formalized being that these protection of the natural bond between mother and child would first be attempted. And only if the mother in the given situation really decided that she couldn't or didn't want to care for her child, then the second option of adoption would would actually come on the table. So now that we've established that there was no legal base for this Still, we're not talking about individual cases. We're talking thousands of women here. So how was it possible to cause such pressure on these women when there was no legal base? In fact, what we must look at is what didn't happen and not so much what did happen. Because, like I said, these women were in a very vulnerable position. They were societal outcasts. They came often into mother-baby homes, they were pressured by their families. And then the authorities who were supposed to support these women and to provide them with information about the choices they had, the rights they had, the possibilities they had, they in fact leaned back. And all these women were ever informed about was that adoption would be the best option for their children. So, for example, these women weren't informed about the fact that since 1965 they would have been entitled to social welfare. They weren't informed about their entitlement to support by their family, financial support by family and the fathers of these children. So what you need to keep in mind when thinking about how these women were, were led into this dead-end road where the only option was to give their child away was that back then they were much less empowered than they are nowadays and also information wasn't as freely available. There was no internet. So they were fully dependent uh, on the institutions. And of course, institutions back then also had... Uh, yeah, quite a big authority. So if, for example, the the Child Protective Board told these women that it would be in the best interest of their child to give them up for adoption, that had a very big impact on these women uh, who were cut off from information, socially pressured, and then also pressured by the authorities that this was the only and the best thing they could do. What were actions the Child Protection Board should have done back then? Well, the Child Protective Board had a number of tasks and also powers in law, which were crucial in the whole process of separating women from their children or what should have been keeping the women and children together. Firstly, the Child Protective Board had authority on the area of what is good for children. So like I explained just then, when the Child Protective Board informed a mother that it would be the best thing for her to give up 
her child that had extra weight to it rather than other institutions or other people who could not claim the authority of being the Child Protective Board would have had. But more concretely, the Child Protective Board had uh, some specific tasks in law. The first was to report about the situation of the child, and this thus included report about the situation of the mother. Obviously, such a report should be based on facts and thorough research. From the cases I have seen, this was not always the case, or differently said, the the reports were rather the opinion of the, the writer rather than based on facts. And these opinions were often quite tainted negatively. Secondly, the Child Protective Board was the only institution that could uh, initiate measures that, child protection measures that could have been taken either to protect this bond between mother or child or to severe it if the, the needs of the child so required. And what is interesting to see is that I have not come across a single case in which the Child Protective Board uh, requested the judge to install a family coach whose legal task it was to support the parents and to actually convince the parents to take care of their children. Not in a single case was this option used. Rather, the measures the Child Protective Board did request was the measure of severing the tie between mother and child and um, the, so the Child Protective Board was the only institution who could request these measures. And it was also in the position that it advised the judge on why this measure was the sensible measure to take. So it was in a very powerful position because it wrote the, it drafted the report upon which the measure was taken. It advised the judge. And in many cases, it was also the link to the, to the mothers who were often not even present during these hearings or didn't even know about them going on. And then finally, the Child Protective Board and the Ministry had a role to play in the supervision of the institutions in which these children were gave birth to their children and in which, for example, the practice took place that women were asked to leave 10 days after giving birth, which put them in a position that they were physically separated from their children, um, which physical separation was later then represented by the Child Protective Board as a decision by the mother and as a sign how, yeah, how she failed to take care of her child, although she didn't have a single choice. And the final very important task in law that the Child Protective Board had was that it had the power to collect the finances owed to the child, in fact, by the mother's family, by the mother herself, and by the father. But also there, I have not yet seen cases in which this power was used in a way that could have also helped the mother to actually finance raising the child. Were there cases in the past, after having agreed to the adoption of their children that women tried to fight for their right to get the children back? Well, one thing is interesting to know is that legally these women still had quite some rights to, to claim their children back until the children would be finally adopted. And adoption was only possible at the earliest two years after the child had been placed with the adoptive parents. So there was quite a time span in which, legally speaking, these women could have claimed their children back. But practically speaking, due to the misinformation, I don't know of any cases that women successfully claimed their children back. And one, a practice that had developed and that also raised the or gave the women the impression that they didn't even have the right to rethink this. Well, you can't even call it a choice. One practice that had developed that that cemented the separation of women and children was that women shortly after physically being separated from their children, were given a declaration uh, and asked to sign the declaration that they agreed with giving their child up for adoption. And that declaration was given to them without any information about the legal process upon which that declaration was based 
or the rights they had. So in legal terms, that declaration was meaningless. But with the women who were given this declaration to sign it, it raised the impression that the decision was final or we we tend to call it a decision but it hadn't often it hadn't been a decision or it was taken in such a vulnerable position that you and and with so little information about their rights and possibilities that you at least cannot speak of a free decision the law case you're currently working on is this the only one in the netherlands or are there others too Well, as far as I know, this is the only law case ongoing. However, what is worth mentioning is that uh, Trudy isn't the only claimant in the in the proceedings. Bureau Clara Wichmann is also a claimant, and she, Bureau Clara Wichmann represents all women who have given up their children uh, under circumstances that you cannot speak of a free and informed decision. What are the most important legal aspects that you're now basing your law case on? Um, the most important aspect is twofold. Uh, it's firstly the, the fact that the family law, also back then, and the adoption law, prescribed two steps in the process. The first being that the natural parents, or the natural mother and the child should be supported in order to protect the family bond between mother and child. And only if the first step um, failed or the mother really, after being informed and being presented with the real options she had, didn't want to take care of her child, that the, the well-being of the child required it to be placed in a family, then the second step came around, adoption. So the first important legal aspect is in our argument, is that, in fact, the first step was never taken. These women were separated, physically separated from their children right after birth. Uh, some women were even blindfolded during the, the time they gave birth. They were not informed about the, the possibilities they had, and that existed back then. They were not informed about their rights. They weren't even informed that it would be wise to consult a lawyer. None of all of this... The, they were physically separated and after that this physical separation was in fact presented as a failure of the women themselves to take care of their children while they had been a victim in being separated from their children while many of them wanted to take care of their children or would have wanted to take care of their children if they would have known that for example they they were entitled to social welfare or that if they had received some form of support. The second important pillar uh, in the legal case is, in fact, discrimination. And why is this so important? It is exactly because the law did not make a difference between married mothers and unmarried mothers. The law protected both the family bond between married mothers and unmarried mothers. Yet, in practice we can see that unmarried mothers, like I just described, did not get the support that they should have gotten by the law. And the only reason or the only uh, explanation I can see or hear in, in the cases I know of is that the, the mother was unmarried at the time she gave birth. What do you and Trudy want to achieve with this law case? Because I can imagine there are not many ways to actually compensate what has been done to her. No, I think we need to be very clear that there is no way to undo what has happened. There is no way to give back the life with her son that she could have had. However, it's very important to gain recognition for the suffering that uh, she, other mothers, the children, the fathers and well, all families involved in the whole tragedy have suffered as a result of this practice. What is the current stand of the Dutch state? Are they willing to face their responsibility? No. Most importantly, the Dutch state claims that uh, the claims of Trudy and Bureau Clara Wichmann are time-barred. Legally speaking, that is correct. However, uh, under Dutch law, there is a possibility to sidestep time-bars if applying a time-bar would in fact be unreasonable. And I believe this is one of these situations where this is the case. 
because uh, there is a very good explanation for the fact that Trudy and other women weren't able to come forward with their claims before. And other than that, the Dutch state also argues that he is not responsible for what happened to Trudy and other women. So, so far there is no sign of the state accepting its role in, in this history. Assuming that you will win this law case, wouldn't this cause a large amount of follow-up suits by other abstandsmutters? I can imagine this is something the Dutch state or the Dutch government really rather wants to avoid. Well, I don't believe that uh, necessarily many uh, or there will be a whole wave of lawsuits. Firstly, because there are other means by which the state can offer recognition. And if the case is won, it, the state might see the need to do so. And secondly, I think we need to remember that for women such as Trudy to pursue such proceedings is emotionally extremely burdensome. So it's not easy to face the defense of the Dutch state. And I must say, I I respect Trudy very much for the strength she shows in going through with this uh, for herself and for all the other women who are affected. And for all the other people who, in other forms, fight for recognition for what has happened. Has this case caused the public attention or media attention that you were hoping for? Has there been some sort of outcry among Dutch society? Well, I must say, I didn't take up the case because I was hoping for some kind of media attention. And to the contrary, I was in fact quite, looking back, I, I don't think surprise is the right word, but I hadn't seen it coming that it would be taken up so on such a big level. What will be the next step in the process? The next step in the process is a public hearing on the 6th of September, in which both Trudy and Bureau Clara Wichmann and the state will be in the position to present their views to the judges. How do you personally estimate your chances of success with this case? Well, it's always difficult to uh, predict how how cases go. Clearly, there's some legal obstacles that are quite difficult. Nevertheless, I believe that Trudy's claim and the argument that the state failed to take the actions that it should have taken is very well is clear and and grounded. Yeah, there's merit to her case. Lisa Marie, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. This was Separated by Force, Afstand's Mooders in the Netherlands. If you like this podcast, please feel free to subscribe on Spotify or Apple Podcast. If you want to support our course, Please share this podcast in your social media to reach the utmost attention for the injustice that has been done to Afsan's mothers and their children in the Netherlands and all over the world. Thank you very much and have a great day. Mm -hmm.